What motivates you? God. Nothing. Is that quite nihilistic? <laughs> what motivates me? It's a really good question, actually. Coffee. I don't drink coffee anymore. Yeah. Struggling. Mm, okay. Curiosity. Yeah. So, what's the question? Aaron Bastani, it's been nine months maybe since we last saw each other. How are you? Very well. Very good. Very happy to be in your incredibly impressive studios here at Joe. You're too kind. Um, your book, Fully Automated Luxury Communism, is full of hope and optimism. And yet, here we are, nine years into ideological austerity that's tearing apart the very social fabric of this country. What is it that gives you cause to be happy? I think there's a great deal to be unhappy about and pessimistic about or let's not say pessimistic, justifiably concerned about. You've got a crisis of demographic ageing, we're not really talking about that. Um, a growing population of oldest old, which really welfare systems, as we know them, won't be able to survive that unless there's major structural reforms. We've got a crisis of automation, climate systems breakdown, and as you've said, austerity, the neoliberal model really isn't garnering much consent. However, I am very optimistic because at the same time we see all of these crises, I also think we're seeing the beginnings of what Marx called a new mode of production. Uh, and we see that in relation to work with AI, deep learning, robotics. We see that in relation to energy with renewables slowly replacing hydrocarbons. And you see it in places like healthcare and food as these become information technologies, which is to say their price is really in freefall. And what I say in fully automated luxury communism is that the project for socialists in the 21st century is to subordinate those potentials to not just solving these crises, which we can do, which is why I'm hopeful, although I hope not irrationally hopeful, because there's nothing worse than false hope, uh, but also go beyond them and actually create societies which are more prosperous than ever before. If you had to single out one of those things that you just mentioned, which do you think is the most pressing, the most significant threat to our society? In the short to medium term for countries in the global north, it's demographic ageing. Uh, so if you think in several decades from now, 25, 30% of the population is over 85, the problem with ageing is that the healthcare concerns around it are exponentially related. So that means when you're 75, you're twice as likely to get a heart attack or dementia as you are at 70, twice as likely again at 80, twice as likely again at 85. So even if we mitigate or cure stroke or heart disease or cancer, there's still these, this plethora of problems, which means that as you have an older population or a big chunk of a population which is very old, Caring for them is incredibly labour intensive, incredibly expensive. In 2016, Standard & Poor said that this would mean 25% of countries really couldn't get credit on global capital markets. They would see their bonds reduced to junk status, which is a big deal. So while I think climate change in the, in the longer term, in the next 50 years, is without doubt the biggest challenge we face, for wealthier countries like Britain, Europe, North America, demographic ageing is massive. And it's no coincidence that uh, the dementia tax played such a prominent role in the last general election. That wasn't just poor electoral management by the Tories, which it was, but it was also the fact they tried to address a problem which is going to require massive political capital being expended by whoever does. Mm. You touched on automation, AI, deep learning there. If those things via capitalism can deliver bounties of resource and labour, mm. what's the motive for getting rid of capitalism? So I would say a few things. Firstly, when it comes to artificial intelligence, the United States, Britain, isn't actually at the leading edge of this. That's China. Why is it China? Because China creates massive amounts of data, which is fundamental to deep learning, and you have massive amounts of state investment into these technologies. So it's not capitalism that's making these things possible. And actually, that's the story of innovation over the last 70 years. The jet engine, touchscreens, internet, um, uh, PV cells, solar cells, the microprocessor, you name it. Every major innovation has been a result of public state-led funding. And because of neoliberalism, countries like Britain and the US are sort of giving up on that, which is why they're relinquishing leadership on AI to China. Now, why should it undermine capitalism is an interesting question. Let's say that artificial intelligence doesn't destroy all of our jobs. Let's just say it, it, it shrinks the, the market for uniquely human skills, right? So there's still many jobs, just not as many as at present. What would that do? it would mean that those jobs who are replaced would see downward pressure on wages. And it would mean that those jobs which aren't replaced become more valuable because they're uniquely human skills. And what does that do? It creates massive inequality. So that's a conservative estimate. It would create inequality on a par you see in low GDP countries, which we don't really think of as democracies, in, in places like Britain. That's, that's a conservative estimate. Worse still, and this is what I suspect, 
a general artificial intelligence, which can do basically anything a, a person can do, uh, would be so cheap and so alluring for capital that the question then would be, why would you hire human workers? And this isn't new in a sense. If you look at the 1950s, there's a great anecdote between Henry Ford III and Walter Reuter, who was a trade unionist. And Ford III takes Walter Reuter through a, his new manufacturing plant, and he points at the new machines, and he says, how are you going to get these guys to pay your union dues? At which point Walter Reuter turns to Ford III and says, how are you going to get them to buy your cars? And that, in a nutshell, is the problem for capitalism. It's a system which creates more and more with less and less human labour over time. Uh, and that's been the tendency for 200 years. But with AI and deep learning, this really goes stratospheric, which means that even if we have unthinkable abundance, most of us don't have the means to access it. And even if you're a capitalist, that's a problem because you need demand. You need people buying your products in order to make profit. How do you propose we bridge that gap Automation comes in, the first jobs to go, we're already seeing it now. Low paid jobs, things like cashiers, drivers, lorry drivers, etc. How do you propose we bridge the gap between significant unemployment and then reaching that field of Avalon, you know, the, the thesis you outline in your book? So there's a few steps I would suggest. The first is universal basic services, which is really an extension of 20th century nationalisations. Education, healthcare, transport, housing, information should be universally free to all citizens. That's a big deal because you don't need to sell your labour to access housing or education or healthcare. That, that's a major thing. And I prefer that to UBI, Universal Basic Income, for a few reasons. Firstly, it helps us deal with these massive challenges immediately, climate change, ageing. Secondly, it's more comprehensible to the electorate at large, so it strategically makes more sense. Uh, and then thirdly, like I say, it really builds on what we've already got in our welfare states in Britain, Europe, and to a lesser extent, North America. So UBS is one part of that, but then also you would want really uh, sexual trade bargaining. So for instance, care workers won't be replaced. And I go into why that's the case in the book. Uh, it's because of something called Moravec's paradox. Turns out that things which will require fine hand-eye motor coordination, very hard to automate, like washing the dishes, beating Gary Kasparov at chess, is a bit easier. So things like you say, uh, radiology, accountancy, cashier, driver, highly repetitive tasks, will be automated. And it's in those areas which we need to not just have a conversation about UBS, but also unionising them, uh, ensuring that the value of labour is reflected optimally. Uh, but then in the long term, those innovations need to be subordinated to a, a more general product, uh, project of public ownership, which is why you know, I, I would say that transportation, you mentioned drivers, logistics, a logistical internet probably should be in public ownership not next year or in the next five or ten years, but ultimately that's the only way you can really, you can really envisage it being uh, distributed in a just way. What makes you think that this automated future won't be a brave new world dystopia where every, every need is catered for and it's swallow the pill and kick back and relax? I don't think every need will ever be catered for. Uh, I don't think fully automated luxury economy isn't some utopia where people aren't sad. And I think that a great way of looking at this is that a small subsection of society has been living effectively in a post-scarcity world for hundreds of years. They're called the aristocracy. What do they do? They have affairs. They have fights. If you read the sort of novels, of the, you know, the Jane Austen novels, etc., they have lives of massive introspection. Now, I, I personally find that quite boring. But the idea that they live uh, lives where human emotions don't penetrate everyday experience just like they do for you or I simply isn't true. So what I would say is to quote John Maynard Keynes, actually such a society would mean we have to answer the fundamental question of humanity, what it is, as he said, to live wisely, agreeably and well. Not an easy question to answer, but certainly a better one than looking for the next meal. Why is it that you place such great faith in technology? I place great faith in human ingenuity, not technology. Um, technology can be for good, it can be bad. If you look, for instance, at gene editing, it's a technology I talk about in the book, CRISPR-Cas9. Gene editing could mean the eradication of thousands of illnesses caused by a single errant nucleotide of DNA, sickle cell, uh, uh, Huntingdon's, Parkinson's, um, cystic fibrosis, all by a single nucleotide could go with gene editing technologies. The precise same technology could allow the aristocracy to literally change their genomes to reflect extant economic inequalities, which is to say they would be biologically as well as economically superior to us. What happens with that technology? Does it eradicate all these diseases? Or does it mean we have some strange world where 
the dream of blue blood finally becomes reality is down to politics. So I have faith in human ingenuity, but I have, uh, I hope, a rational scepticism about technology under conditions of capitalism. By accelerating technological advancement, embracing greed, we will destroy the planet. We already are. What's your answer to that? Well, technology isn't destroying the planet per se. Humans and capitalism are. Uh, if you look at, for instance, the agricultural revolution, it starts 12,000 years ago. That's a technology. It's the first technological revolution, really. Before agriculture, 12,000 years ago, there were 5 million people living on the planet. Before the Industrial Revolution, by about 1800, there are a billion. So technologies had an intimate relationship with the growth of our species for a long time. And people need to have an expanded understanding of technology. It encompasses, like I said, agriculture, language, numeracy, cities, culture. These are all technologies. What I think is that if we get the technologies of today and we put them under new social relations, then we won't be destroying the planet. What's destroying the planet is the social relations of capitalism. What is that? It's production for profit. It's production for exchange. So let's look at that in, a, in, a, in an interesting way. Agriculture creates huge, huge amounts of greenhouse gases, huge, uses huge amounts of water, land. One, I I'm not one for lifestyleism, but if you want to do one thing to save the planet, it's to stop eating meat and probably stop flying. Two of the things you can personally do. If you look at uh, innovations in cellular agriculture, synthetic meat, there was a study by the University of Amsterdam and Oxford, 2011, and they said that when it came to greenhouse gas emissions, water, land, labour, actually if we switched to synthetic meat, you'd see a reduction of between 90 and 99% for all these various things. So that's one example of technology allowing us to live as we presently do, but also living within the biocapacity of our planet. Now, that doesn't mean we get to keep capitalism, but what I say is actually there is a plausible solution here, which doesn't mean we have to lead dramatically different lives. You know, I've heard stories of people, they become radicalised around green issues and they stop hoovering their house. You know, this is absurd. Or they, they will no longer buy uh, balloons for kids' parties, which are recyclable, by the way, if they're latex. This is silly. Most energy you're consuming isn't for electricity, actually. Heating is where most energy is being used. How would we retrofit homes to make them energy efficient? Very low-tech technology. The reason we're not, again, is the economic system we live under. Something else that you advocate for is materialism. And that materialism, I think, has undermined our best efforts at self-sufficiency, environmental protection. How do you reconcile those two things? What do you mean by materialism? The outward, not obsession with, but enjoyment of procuring goods, and often actually goods that we don't need. So for instance, UBS, uh, these would be in public ownership. And they would be what I call communal luxury. So for instance, the idea of, uh, I wouldn't call myself a materialist person, although I think people, working class people aren't stupid. They recognise that they do need to hoover. And actually they want a hoover which is nice and works efficiently and cleans up things really quickly. And, and they will to, use it. And they will use them. You know, so I'm not, I'm not resistant to the idea of people having nice things, but you're right, there's a, there's a few issues that need to be unpacked. The first is conspicuous consumption. The act of spending money in order to present to other people how affluent you are. I clearly, I, I'm resistant to that. But what is that I, I, act of conspicuous consumption? It's an act which says, I have so much wealth and such means available to me I can buy something I don't even need and I don't even think about it. Now, under conditions of post-scarcity, where things are getting cheap all the time, where all of us can access more and more resources, that mindset, that, that kind of consciousness, I, I argue, could disappear if it was attendant with a certain political project. If you look at, um, I've said, for instance, with gene editing, that will dematerialise a lot, a lot of the economy. It would eradicate much of the pharmaceutical industry. It would really change how we think about healthcare. If you look at what's happened to music and film since the early 2000s with the emergence of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, that had a profound impact on how people viewed culture. Now, that's been reappropriated by capitalism through rentierism, through streaming services, but there was a short window of time with Napster, with LimeWire, with Pirate Bay, where people viewed culture as something which should be freely available uh, and to all people. And that is really how I view most social goods and actually when those things were available to them that wasn't viewed as materialistic it was viewed as a commons it was viewed as something which everybody could enjoy that's what i want more and more of the economy to look like rather than all of us in our little shells now if you look at elon musk this is somebody who's worth 20 billion dollars 
He owns half the equity in SpaceX. If anybody has agency in this world of ours, it's him, right? Probably even more than, say, Donald Trump. He can do quite decisive things because SpaceX isn't even a, doesn't even have shareholders. Now, he wants to create the solution for urban gridlock in Los Angeles with his new boring company. What does he do? He builds a tunnel. And it's not a tunnel for Hyperloop. It's a paved car tunnel for people to drive through. Now, the London Underground, which is 150 years old, is a better solution to urban gridlock. With these technologies at our disposal, I don't want people like Elon Musk and their mental conceptions and their prejudices about the world defining what we do with them, right? I don't want them editing their kids' genomes to be seven feet tall, them driving around in a, you know, a, a network of underground. It's ridiculous, you know? Let's just have free electric buses for everyone. Let's just have powerful 21st century healthcare. So um, that's the answer to that, really. It is. The Guardian described you as an accelerationist. Yeah. Do you think that's a fair assessment? No. I'm, go on. No, no, I'm not. I'm not an acceler. I'm not an accelerationist. Again, it's about human ingenuity. Are we holding back human ingenuity? Yes. Of course, for some people, that means you're holding back capitalism. You need to accelerate capitalism. I don't think we need to accelerate capitalism. I think we need to get rid of capitalism so we can unleash human ingenuity. And I think most people grasp that, right? What, what job are you doing? Do you really feel you're being stretched today? Okay. Some people will say yes. Most people won't. They also characterised you as a provocateur. Do you think that's more accurate? Not in relation to the book. I mean, I am a provocateur, yes, but not in relation to the book. That's what I was getting at. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> it's, 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 it is important to provoke people. I think the most important thing for me when I look at people, say Paul Mason, I don't agree with everything he writes. I don't think anybody would call him a provocateur. Provocateur implies that you want to provoke people needlessly. But Paul says things and I think, does he really think that? But what he does by doing that is challenge your assumptions. And then you might not agree with him, but you also don't agree with what you previously thought, and you arrive at a new uh, set of ideas. And that's why provocation is a really important part of intellectual growth for individuals, but also for society. But I wouldn't label myself a prov provocateur, no. The political path to achieving what you've described, th that you li lay out in your book, is a kind of populism. Mm. How does it differ from the populism that we see currently in our society, from the likes of Nigel Farage? Quite dramatically. Uh, I think all pop politics is populist. Uh, this is talked about by a guy called Jack Rancière. He talks about naming the people. And in politics, if you want to command democratic energies, you need the people. The question is, who are the people? Uh, and so the question for progressives is, how do you make the people? Now, for Farage, or for the right historically, for the nativist right, the people is very easy to, to define. Has a certain set of cultural or uh, racial features, characteristics. While for the left, traditionally, historically, it's been the working class. That's how I would define the people. So I am a populist in so much as they are my agent of change. Uh, and also, I think they uniquely can change Britain, the, wo the world, for the better. Uh, and in terms of selling the idea of fully automated luxury communism to them, what I say is transitioning beyond fossil fuels, uh, decommodifying education, healthcare, housing, this is not something where you will live less fulfilling lives, but more fulfilling lives. You'll live in nicer homes. You'll have access to better transport. You won't be worried about the MOT because you'll be using ultra fast underground, you know, transport in London or electric buses, etc. So I would call it populism, but it's a populism which names the people as people who have to sell their labor for a wage, which is working class people. Whereas somebody like Nigel Farage will say the people are white or English speakers. Uh, and the worry is in the 21st century that given the challenges of ageing, climate change, etc., these people have a ready-made ide ideology to take off the shelf. Um, and what I think centrists don't understand is that being right and correcting them and saying it's there, not there, on Twitter, isn't a, a political response. Because as you have climate systems break down, hundreds of millions of refugees, you have the breakdown of welfare systems for an ageing population, you do need big solutions. People understand the problems are huge and they intuitively grasp that sort of adjusting the cufflinks isn't going to do it. So you do need also decisive action. And that's where populism comes in. You say, look, these solutions, we're going to be honest with you, these, these problems need major solutions, but they'll make your lives better, not worse. Just finally, before we started recording, the Sag dropped out of the Tory leadership oh. contest. He was beaten. Um, we're left with Michael Gove, Jeremy Hunt and Boris Johnson. If you had to pick one of the three, who would you pick to be your next Prime Minister? I think from a Labour perspective, it doesn't matter. Uh, I've already said that Jeremy Hunt was formerly the Health Secretary and doctors and nurses hate him. 
Uh, Michael Gove was formerly education, teachers hate him, and Boris Johnson was the former foreign secretary, and broadly speaking, the rest of the world hates him. So from a Labour perspective, or for, 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 for anybody who wants to see a, you know, a better country emerge from where we presently are, none of them really bother me. And I also don't think that the success of to Theresa May will last very long. Uh, so it's really a moot point. Even amongst those three, they're probably thinking maybe the best bet would be, be uh, being the person after the, the winner of this competition. So uh, I really don't mind. I think Labour could trounce any of the three. Do you? Gun to your head, though. Pick one. <laughs> Gun to my head. Wow. In terms of not coarsening public debate, it would probably be Jeremy Hunt. Whereas Boris Johnson's going to say outlandish things which just normalise attacks on LGBT people perhaps, or brown people, Muslims, etc. So probably Jeremy Hunt, just because from the top down you wouldn't have the kind of rhetoric which you almost certainly would have with Boris Johnson. Mm. But that said, the actual policies of all three I think would be broadly the same. Identikit. Mm. Aaron Bastani, thank you so much. Legend, thank you.